Uh, Jeff Pederos is Senior UX Manager for Tableau Software. I think the most interesting thing um, that came out of our little conversation just now about his background is that he really got his start on his Trash 8, I'm sorry, on his TRS-80, um, <laughs> where he uh, sketched out or actually created interfaces for games, not yet knowing exactly how games might work, but already thinking about the UI, thinking about the the, the computer to human interface, as we like to call it in Big High. So please um, give a warm welcome to Jeff Petty Ross. Thank you. So data visualization, I'm glad so many of you are here. I kind of stumbled into this four years ago when I joined Tableau. I had a glimpse into the potential of the field, but I really didn't understand what I was getting into. Uh, now, I believe that we are just at the verge of a revolution in our society. And I don't mean to be hyperbolic about Tableau or any particular piece of software or software at all, or really even to be hyperbolic about charts and graphs, but we have an opportunity to evangelize, to introduce our friends, our colleagues, our family even, to this, what really is a beautiful science. And you know, to some extent, it also applies to computer and software design, which is why it's, it's a perfect topic for here, I think. But I hope that you leave tonight with a deeper understanding of the science of data visualization. So my background is in computer science, um, software design. I've been doing this for 20 odd years leading teams, uh, doing design, a little bit of coding along the way as well. I get to work alongside people at Tableau now uh, from all walks of life, uh, including my, my colleague and, and manager, Dr. Jock McKinley, who was one of those first three attendees. Uh, he, is, he has taught me, see, I get to, I, he doesn't believe I say this at every talk, but I really do. Um, clearly, clearly, I have learned a ton about data visualization from him. I mean, 30 years ago here at Park, he was helping create the field of computerized information visualization. 30 years later, we're benefiting from the work of pioneers like that and also work that goes back much farther. As a matter of fact, I wanted to go back about 150 years. Uh, so if you've read Tufty, I'm sure you've seen this. Even if you haven't, you might have seen this. Charles Minard created this. This is the story of the downfall of the French Empire, how Napoleon's hubris brought it to its end. So a little history, though. First, in 1801, France looked like this. Uh, by 1812, Napoleon had been in power for about eight years. And he had conducted a decade-long expansion by military that made the French Empire look like this. So here we are, you're Napoleon, you're short, you're at the height of your power. <laughs> and what you need to do is you need to go prove to England that you're serious. So the way he's gonna do this is he's gonna go defeat Russia. So he takes his entire conscripted army, piles them together up in the northeast corner of the empire and starts heading off toward Russia. Uh, but the campaign ultimately failed and that's why France looks like this today, with all apologies to the French. So let's go back to this story here. In June of 1812, Napoleon amassed his army here and down in this corner. This is near Warsaw. And he's heading over there toward Moscow. So as he starts heading east, that's the orange line going east. And you can see over the next several months, so about three months, Brutal and effective Russian tactics slowly dwindled the French forces. The Russians would lie in wait, kill a bunch of them, and run off. And they would also destroy the French supply line along the way. So by the time they finally got to Moscow, Napoleon had lost over half of his troops at this point. And this is when the Russian strategy really kicked in, because they had abandoned their capital and burned it to the ground. Three quarters of, of uh, Moscow was either burned or in flames when they arrived. How do you beat that army? But now it's September. It's cold. The Russian winter is setting in. Your supply lines are cut, so Napoleon had to turn around and go back to France without the victory he wanted. 
So he follows the route along the black line back, and you can see the Russians continued attacking him. And now, not only are the Russians attacking him, but down here in the bottom, this line represents the temperature that's dropping as he goes from Moscow back to Poland, down ultimately to a uh, low of 37 degrees below zero, happens to be Celsius, it's very similar in Fahrenheit, in uh, Malodzechna. So ultimately, Napoleon was defeated. He didn't deliver the victory he wanted. He had already conscripted most of the men of fighting age in the French Empire. His allies turned on him, and this data visualization captures this story. So Minard, Charles Minard, who created that, had this intuitive sense of how to communicate data visually. This intuition really made him a pioneer in a field that was just beginning to come into its own, one that would eventually turn into the beautiful science of data visualization. And I call it a science because it's now, and what makes this the most exciting is it's based on the observations of cognitive science and perceptual psychology. In other words, we've actually started studying how our brains see and understand data. And that gives us concrete ways we can help people perceive it and actually think. So how do we actually do this? So we've all got brains in our heads, and it turns out it's not just a mass of undifferentiated goo. There's parts to our brains. You've got the uh, prefrontal cortex up here, which is responsible for personality and decision making, among other things. Uh, at the very back right here, I shaved just for this talk, you have the visual cortex, which we're going to talk about a lot. So it turns out all these different parts of the brain work together. So let's exercise a little bit. Those of, those of you who are at dinner tonight, and maybe a glass or two of wine, forgive the exercise, but stay with me here. Let's count. How many dots do you see? Nine. Excellent. We need to have more wine at dinner. Uh, so why did we start here? Well, how many nines are there? We'll get back there in a moment. So when you started doing this exercise, there's actually a specific part of your brain that lit up. There's a part that's responsible for counting. And it's a different part from the part that knows like a lot and a little. And it's a different part that even knows the numbers from one to about five. There's a specific counting center of your brain, and it lights up when you do this exercise. But it struggles a bit when we get here, but what if we do this? Now how many nines are there? 10, it turns out. So what happened? We took two parts of our brain. We took the visual cortex, and we took the counting center, and we brought them together, and we got to use them at the same time. That's how our brains work. No one ever taught you how to count red nines that I know of. But these parts work together. Now, we can use this in, in some more substantial data viz as well. So here, each number represents one country. And I've stuck with uh, Europe and the Americas for the most part here. And specifically, it's the percent of their economy that they spend on the military. So for example, that five there is the percent of our GDP that we spend on the military in the US. So what if I want to know how common it is to spend 5% or more across all these countries? Well, I could look for all the numbers that are five or bigger and try to pull them out. Or I could color them. And I could quickly see that there were three. Now, that's taking advantage of perceptual pop-out. Our visual cortex lights up, helps us see those numbers that are five or larger. Now, I could also sort the numbers. And now I start taking advantage of things like clustering and my cognition about sorting. And I can make new sense of it. So that when I add more data, I get to see something else. I see there's a big jump. A cluster jumps out at me in the Middle East, and I learn something new. So I start layering my cognitive understanding of this data, what's a country, what are these regions, what does 5% mean, along with a rapid visual understanding of these numbers. But we can take this information that we've looked at now, we've got some color, we've got some grouping, we've got some sorting, and we can spread it out a different way. Let's use space to represent geography. Now that's that same data, 
I've left out the, the Americas here, but you may notice there are no two countries in Europe that light up. That's because they're so small, you can't even see them at this scale. So we've traded the positional information of sorting and used it to d convey geography instead, an area. Look how brightly Saudi Arabia stands out here. And you notice we're kind of getting into a dialogue, right? We ask and answer questions of the data. I asked the question about what countries spend, spend more than 5%, and I got curious about where they are. I got curious about how they make group together, and I can see there is actually a strong geographical grouping, too. Now, I can layer on more information if I add size, for example. So here I can see not only what is the proportionate spending in color, but I've added the size of the circle to indicate overall spending. So I can see that Germany and the UK actually spend more than Saudi Arabia. It's just a smaller percent of their economy. So one section after another, exploring that data, we lit up our brains. We assigned meaning to things like position and color, maps. But there's a downside to all that power to quickly create meaning. Our own brains sometimes can betray us. So I'm going to illustrate that with a story. Now, when I was a kid, that was about the time they invented ATMs, cash machines. And my mom, this is a, a modern ATM, but my mother happened to work for a bank at the time, Connecticut Bank and Trust. Now, this bank was pretty unremarkable, except for one thing. They were early leaders in the idea of cash machines. They believed in them. They believed in the power of letting people get to their money more quickly and more conveniently, 24 hours a day. But if you're around at the time, this was not a foregone conclusion. If I go to this machine, I ask for $100, and it gives me 420s, what do I do? There's no teller there to have a conversation with. So this bank knew that they had to build trust. So that's when they came up with this. They literally put a friendly face on them. Meet Barney. So this name and this icon were the logo of these ATMs. He's not purple and he's not a dinosaur. This is pre that Barney also. But three circles, two curves, a couple lines, a couple triangles, and suddenly it's a face. And not just a face, but one that actually kind of suggests trust. So Barney was so effective, so successful, that it turned out that all the ATMs in New England started to be called, were called Barney machines. Uh, and Connecticut Bank and Trust did some research on Barney. They went and they asked a whole bunch of people, what do you like most about the logo? Uh, and what was really interesting about this was they said they liked his smile. <laughs> now, this is remarkable for at least two reasons. First, Barney's not a person. And second, of course, he doesn't have a smile. <laughs> so what's going on here? Well, our memories work in these same patterns that our brains are so good at picking out. And so we take things and we tend to mix them together. It's kind of like this drawing here in our minds. We don't have a clean separation between up and climbing, stairs and walking, trustworthy and smiling. They get all jumbled together. This is, of course, one of our biggest strengths, too, right? Because if we couldn't make these patterns, how hard would it be to drive a car? if you had to remember how to operate every little piece of it every day. But this tendency to remember patterns incorrectly, it actually has a name. It's called cognitive biases. You may have heard of them. There's a whole bunch of them that I could name. Uh, there is, for example, uh, stereotyping. Right? I know what these people are like. Um, or primacy and recency is a little bit less inflammatory. So if you're given a list of unrelated things, you tend to remember the first thing in the list and the last thing in the list. We use this all the time. Watch credits on TV, right? The big stars are listed first. The special guest stars are listed last. Because their agents know to negotiate for those spots. Those are the ones we actually remember. Now this is where data visualization comes in. Our visual system is primed to pick up new information before we can take our old cognitive biases and lay them on our understanding. They basically take a drawing like this and simplify it down to this. Data viz helps reduce this cognitive bias. It takes advantage of how we perceive. It takes advantage of the fact 
that the visual cortex, as small as it is, is one of the fastest and most powerful channels to get information into our brains. So it basically kind of lets us hack the brain in a way, if you will. It shortcuts our incorrect thoughts, some of them. So how do we hack the brain? And this is where the science comes in. It started to teach us the ways we can actually shortcut those incorrect cognitive pathways. And we can use features like this. You can see there's things like length and width. We've already looked at things like size and color hue and a little bit about grouping as well, right? So I'd like to show a short video, there's no audio here, I'm just going to narrate it, that uh, highlights some research that Christopher Healy did at North Carolina State University. And just play along for a moment as I narrate what this is telling us about pre-attentive features. Now what it's going to do is walk us through a series of exercises. So for example, here we're going to differentiate color. What you need to do now is figure out, is there a red dot on the screen or not? Nope. Yep. Nope. Now watch, this is going to start going faster and faster, but our ability to notice whether that dot is there or not keeps up with it. This is how fast and powerful our visual systems are. Now color is one way we can do it. This is color hue in this case, but also shape. So is there a red circle on the screen or not? Is there a PowerPoint icon bouncing on the screen or not? <laughs> PowerPoint's yelling at me. Now it turns out you can start using more of these things together sometimes as well. So in this case, what happens if we look for a red circle with blue circles and a red square? Well, maybe we can't. it does get harder. But you'll notice at the same time, I'm not going to get too deeply into which features you can combine together tonight, but it's not hard to figure out, right? Color boundary is a very strong one. Can you see whether the line is running horizontally or vertical between these different circles? Now even as we start adding more shapes in, it's still easy to see whether the line of demarcation goes horizontally or vertically. The same thing applies if we start looking at shapes as well. So if we start mixing together squares and circles but keep them separated across a boundary like this, even as we add color back in, you'll notice we can find these boundaries very quickly. So there are some tasks that we can use our visual cortex to overcome what we think we might know better in our brains. So how does this apply to data? Well, I'm going to step back for a minute and just talk about the different kinds of data. There's categorical data. You can break the world down into categories like continents or people or beverages. There's ordinal data, which is categories. You can just put one after another, gold, silver, bronze, and so forth. And there's quantitative data. This is what you can lay across an axis, or what you can do math on is another way of thinking about it. And you'll notice that I actually put dates in both of them, because things like months have an order, but it's very hard to subtract January from February. But I can figure out how far apart two dates are. So dates kind of fall into both of these buckets. So how does this map back into the visual features? How can we take advantage of those signals of color and shape to see these things? So research tells us that these are the five of the best ways to look at categorical data. Position is a very strong way. If you think about it, if you look at a bar graph, what is each bar? 
It's a category that separates, that is all separated out, one bucket of information in each category. Use things like color hues and shape. Clustering, we saw that on the maps. Ordinal data also with position, but it starts mattering what order you put them in. How confusing would it be if we put gold in between bronze and silver? Size, we can use size to start indicating magnitude. Color intensity, hues and shapes, and finally for quantitative data, again, position. How far along an axis do we want to draw something? For all these kinds of data, we want to choose how we use position carefully because it is one of the most powerful encodings. What is the data we want to call out? And you can start using things like length as well. Again, bars come to mind instantly. And orientation is really interesting for lines. Our brains are really good at determining horizontal and vertical and up and down very quickly. So we can see whether there's something trending up or down. So I want to come back to Menard again for a moment, or Minard. Armed with this information about visual features, we can now take a look at this again and see what it tells us about Minard's drawing. Why was it so effective? It uses position to communicate where battles happen, yes, but it uses color encoding to tell us whether we're going east or west by hue. Size indicates the troop strength. Orientation indicates both the direction of travel, but also whether the temperature is rising or falling. Though it is a little bit unconventional that the most recent is at the left and the farthest back in time is on the right. So let's look at some other time-tested examples. Where else has DataViz been used this effectively sometimes in the past? And how can we apply modern science to help us understand it? So in the 1800s, you might be familiar with this story. There was a London doctor named John Snow who was trying to figure out how cholera got transmitted and explain it to other people. Turns out that there was this pump here on Broad Street that was infected with cholera. And he started mapping out all the cases of where cholera was breaking out in London and making a little mark. So you can see there are a whole bunch of cases here. So like all maps, this uses position to indicate geography. This also uses a length. If you look at those marks all together, they basically turn into a length. that say something about the quantity of data there. Clustering lets us quickly understand that the outbreak certainly was around the pump. This was new information at the time. This map finally helped convince the uh, government that they should take the handle off that pump after the fact. Here's another chart from England in the 1800s. This one's from Florence Nightingale. And the colors are a little bit washed out here, but there's a, a pink region and a blue region on the outside and black as well. I guess I'm just going to talk a lot about death tonight. So she wanted to explain that there were people dying in the Crimean War who were dying of not battle wounds. And so the red represents the battle wounds, or the pink, and the blue represents all the people dying from treatable diseases. So she uses color hue to indicate a category. How did they die? She uses area to indicate the number of deaths, deaths. She uses also the ordinal value of months going around in a circle and uses position to differentiate from those. So you can see each of these examples, which has stood the test of time and is cited again and again, for all their strengths and weaknesses, there's a reason why. Even before they understood the science, they happened to be taking advantage of how our brains work. Here's one last example. This is from 1,300 years ago. These star charts are from the world's oldest complete preserved star atlas. Back before Europe was even a thing, Chinese astronomer, astronomers were displaying position to show where stars were in the sky. They were using categorical color encoding. There's only black and yellow on here, but on some maps there's also white. And those three categories indicate the three different schools of uh, constellations. So for, and then you can also see clustering and the lines connecting them to illustrate what the constellations were. So for over a thousand years, society has been trying to figure out with their intuition how to portray information graphically. So I'd like to take this ancient fascination with the stars and combine it with something more recent. So who's heard of the Kepler Space Telescope? 
we're looking to move anytime soon, it might help. Uh, most recently in the news, they just announced they found Earth 2.0. What the Kepler Space Telescope is doing is it's staring really intently at one part of the sky. And it's watching the stars in that part of the sky to see how their colors and intensity changes very subtly. I mean, this is a telescope in space. And it stares at the sky and it notices very, very tiny changes in color, but if they happen at the same frequency over time, you can start figuring out, well, there's a planet traveling in front of that star. And not only that, they can figure out how far away the planet is from the star, how big it is, how hot it is, and possibly even the composition of the planet as well. So I thought that we could dig into this data a little bit and see if DataViz could help us understand this information we're getting from the telescope. So I've got that data here. I did pull it into Tableau, but more important than the tool is just how quickly we can start asking and answering questions of it. So first, let's get a sense how many planets has the Kepler Space Telescope possibly discovered. So let's start there. There's one box for every planet that the Kepler Space Telescope thinks it might have discovered, or the scientists looking at it do. And you can quickly see, well, it's not dozens and it's not millions, it's actually a few thousand, right? We form that conclusion pretty quickly. So, all right, it's found a bunch of possible planets. Which ones really are planets? Well, they call that disposition. So when I drop that on color, what we're gonna see now is it's gonna break this out into three colors. The candidate planets, the ones that still might be planets, the ones that are confirmed, we've actually, the best of our science tells us there are planets that it's seen, and then there are some false positives. So the confirmed are there in orange, the candidates that we're still investigating are in blue, and the false positives are in gray. Again, quickly, we jump to a conclusion about what's the proportion of these? What's the different ratio? So now we have an idea of these stars, or the planets around them, so where are they? How do they lay out in the sky compared to each other? Well, it turns out just like we have latitude and longitude on Earth, there is right ascension and declination up in the sky. So I'm gonna take right ascension, and I'm gonna start spreading out the stars that way. I'm gonna take declination and spread them out the other way. And just like a map, I don't need to include zero in this scatter plot, right? Imagine if you included that point in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in every map. So that is the pattern of the planets that the Kepler Space Telescope thinks it might have found. I'm just gonna keep personifying it all night, if you'll forgive me. Those are the confirmed ones, candidates, and the false positive. Notice by highlighting them, we again get a different sense of proportion. But one thing that jumps out right away is, there's an interesting grid pattern. It looks like a window into space. So when I was digging into this data for the first time, I was curious, why did it look like that? Well, it turns out if you look inside the telescope before they launched it, here is what the imaging apparatus looks like inside. This actually, so down in the corner, I'm gonna go and try that. Down there, you see the little tiny blue, blue in the corner there, that's actually what they use to help aim it. They take a very small photo, make sure it's roughly at the right spot, and then they use the big array to take the ongoing fine grain images. So let's go back though now, how much of the sky have we looked at? So we haven't figured out the whole faster than light travel thing, but if we wanted to head out, where should we go? So let's take a look. Now I'm going to say declination, which is like latitude, just runs similarly. So it goes from negative 90 to 90. And then right ascension goes from zero to 360 degrees. So now I'm, again, using our sense of proportion to realize we have just begun to start looking at the sky and figure out where these things might be. This is one telescope in space just beginning to ex explore a postage stamp size bit of where we might go someday. But where do we want to go? So I'm gonna look a little bit at taking position to understand this data better. I've started spreading out the planets this way to see how big they are. So that is number of Earth radius, radii represented there. So that big one up top is almost 4,000 times the radius of Earth. I can imagine there might be a little gravity involved. And then the orbit size compared to Earth's as well. There are some outliers way out there, dozens of times the orbit of Earth. I'm not even going to, to include them on here. 
So I mentioned that the Kepler Space Telescope found Earth 2.0, and it actually found about eight other candidate planets that might be Earth-like enough we could live there someday. But even with this fairly rudimentary view of the data, without all the advanced statistical tools and understanding of astronomy the science that the astronomers have, we can just do things like, let's take the planet temperature and bring it down close to the range of Earth. So I'm going to cap it out at 275 Kelvin. And I'm going to take the planetary radius and get rid of the ones that are way out there. 109 Earths, probably not going to happen. But actually, if you get down to about one and three quarter Earths, that's about the size we could still live. And what I've done here is I've used a new kind of encoding, shape encoding, to show us the ones that are filled in are indeed the candidates that the Kepler Space Telescope team has identified are the likely places we could live. And there are no filled in ones that we filtered out. So just using this sense of intuition, the sense of visually understanding the data, to look at things like temperature and size, we can rapidly understand something about it in a way that actually correlates to what our best scientific knowledge means as well. So let's pause and reflect on what just happened. We used color hue. We used intensity. We used clustering, boundary detection, size. All these things told us something about the data. We got an intuitive textural sense of it, much faster than our cognitive understanding. But the two informed each other. We learned something about the shape of the sky, but we had to have a sense of what the sky was and what stars were to begin with, what it means to possibly live somewhere else. So what makes the science of data viz so cool, if I can use a coarse word like that, is that it lets anyone understand data by just being curious enough to ask questions about it. And that often leads to more questions, right? We gain some amount of insight, and we get another question, which leads to this drawing, something that at Tableau we call the cycle of visual analysis. But it's not specific to Tableau, except that we drew it this way. You start with something you want to do. I'm curious. I read a story about the stars and Kepler. So I got some data. I decided how I wanted to look at it. Well, first I wanted to just count them. And then we see it, we develop an insight, and we get new questions. This happens over and over again. We get into a conversation with the data. But of course, in the real world, when we're doing science or business or whatever it is that actually sits behind our data, our running log, you name it, it doesn't always work this way, right? You get your data, you find out, well, it's not compatible with your tool, so you have to go get more data. Or you choose your visual mapping and find out it's the wrong one, and you actually or you gain some insight so quickly, you actually change your task before you finish, getting around to the last part where you go grab someone and say, hey, Jock, there's this really cool thing I found. Come see. So this is sort of an idealized model of how we might get into this conversation with our data. So talking about, just about UX for a moment, again, getting back to just the screen in Tableau, you'll notice that at the very top, we have these two things called rows and columns. Because that positional encoding, that ability to spread your data out positionally, is the most important way to understand your data. So we elected to put it right at the top of the screen. And there's things like color, and size, and shape. And you notice there are places you can drop them, right there on the left. Color, size, and shape. Detail, which helps set the grain of your data. All these things we know about how to see and understand data, we tried to bake into the top level of the user experience. Why? Because these are the ways we want to encourage people to ask and answer questions. And it leads us to four principles of visual analysis that I want to share with you. First is that it's an incremental process. We ask one question, we develop an understanding, we ask another question, and it keeps going on. I've used the word conversation over and over, because that is what it's really like. If you weren't being so patiently quiet, we'd actually be engaged in the conversation right now, right? We'd be asking and answering each other's questions. We'd be learning about each other as we go. So we build our understanding of data in the same way. We get into this dialogue with it. We get friendly. We learn more about it. So the first idea of data viz that I want to share is this incremental nature of understanding it doesn't all just unfold at once. Next time you see a data viz in something like the New York Times, watch how they artfully unfold the story one step at a time. 
even if it's in one screen or multiple. Second thing is that data really requires an expressive canvas. Right? We looked at a, so many different ways just to look at the planets. But there's some pretty, uh, well, it's pretty. <laughs> but there are also really informative ways to look at data. And if you try to narrow it to just a few ways, you're really not going to be able to ask and answer lots of questions. So whether you want to look at the travel of some consultants around London, or you want to make this, this sort of barcode version of the NBA basketball season, or over here, a story about the decline in, in lamb production in Belarusia, uh, Molchanya Yanyat, which is uh, Silence of the Lambs. The third thing I want to talk about is it's important to actually be unified with the data. And what I mean by that is you don't want to have this disintermediation between the person who's asking the question of the data and the data itself. Right? For a long time, you knew how to write SQL so you could get data out, but then you're just left with these giant tables of numbers. Or you got these giant tables of numbers and you can make pictures out of them, but then you wanted a new table of numbers. So you had to go back to the person who wrote SQL, ask them to do it, and so forth and so on. You go back and forth. So you want to keep the useful abstractions, but not the ones that get in the way. So the conversation needs to be directly with the data. What this also means, the reason why I chose this picture, like why does this have to do with unified? The reason I picked this one is that it also means that as the data gets bigger, you don't need your tool to get bigger necessarily either. Whatever you're using, whether it's Excel or Power BI or Tableau or ClickView or it doesn't matter, the tool wants to be able to take it full advantage of the power of the cloud or the data farm or whatever you have. Just make sure that you're, whatever you're doing to look at the data doesn't get in the way. And finally, there's a principle of directness. I didn't actually get into this too much when we were wandering through Tableau, but the idea that I want to be able to reach out and touch my data, to be able to see what it is, to be able to ask a question about it and say, you, what do you mean? And so I can see that this one is one particular planet that Kepler might have discovered. So that way of asking and answering questions isn't just always about issuing queries to a database and seeing some answer, but being able to ask micro questions as well and have smaller interactions. And again, look at some of the favorite places you have for data visualization on the web today. They take advantage of tools like this all the time to engage you and help inform you as you, as you understand the story. So, I do want to start moving toward, a, yeah, toward wrapping up. Um, but I wanted to step back and, and talk a little bit about the history that got us here as a people, not just the last 30 years. As a race, we've long used science to explain the way things work, right? We had fire in the wheel long before we understood exothermic chemical reactions or Newton's laws of motion. So let's step back in time before we understood anything about data viz, before we studied pre-attentive attributes. So over 500 years ago, white men from Europe discovered the Marshall Islands. Where it happened, it turned out there were a whole bunch of people who discovered them a long time ago and had been living there. So the Marshall Islands are miles away from each other. Standing on the shore, this actually is probably not from the Marshall Islands, but it's what you would see. You can't see anything else from the shore of one of these islands. But these white men showed up, and they would find the Marshallese Islanders would get into canoes, and they would paddle from one island to another. And they would do this by day, not by night, right? You know, the Europeans knew how to use the stars and the sun. They were getting by day, any time of day, set out in a canoe and get there. So it turned, you know, this is nothing short of magic, but it turned out what would happen is that the Marshallese would get into their canoes and they would actually, you know, they would kneel down. You can imagine them kneeling down in the bow of their canoe and they could feel the shape of the water. They could feel the way the currents moved and how the water would reflect off the under, undersea shores of all the other islands around. They would know where the currents were and they would use that to feel the ocean and get from one island to another unerringly. How did they learn to do this? Well, they had sample data. So this is from the uh, Museum of Science in Boston. 
And this is a sample of how to use Marshallese navigation. They create these things called stick maps. So this stick map is a teaching tool. It represents a fictitious set of water movement through a made up set of islands. So this curve here represents the current coming from the right. You can see there are three other curves representing other currents. These shells here, these shells or stones, would represent the islands. So this is what a real stick map would look like. Now what's most interesting to me about this is people didn't run out and share these with each other. I don't think they were trying to keep it from each other. They would use it as their own reference. They realized that their brains couldn't take this much complexity and hang on to it with accuracy, so they would make these maps as references. But I imagine what would happen is like one person would be standing there holding this up and someone else would come up and go, that's cool, what'd you do? And so this idea of, sp of navigating with stick maps spread. Now, today though, we don't just have maps and charts and graphs. We're starting to understand the science behind why they work. So what happened to us when we finally understood physics and chemistry, right? We were able to take the wheel and fire that we had been using for millennia and start building things like railroads and cars and rockets. Every time we gain a new scientific understanding, we take a giant leap forward in our progress, and this is where we are with data today. We've just started understanding how fire and the wheel work with data, why position and shape and color, and all these things are so effective, and we're at the verge of this ocean of data, more and more that matters to more of us every day whether it's personal data or business data or whatever. We really are at the edge of a huge revolution, the difference of how we're going to work as a society and as a people. I can't wait to see what this revolution brings to all of us. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. And I'd be happy to take some questions. So you say that we're at a primitive uh, state, but it seemed from your presentation that we're all pretty advanced. I'm like, so what's something that you would, can you jump ahead and tell us what would be enabled when this revolution has happened? I mean, I don't quite get around why we're so primitive. We're still at the, the fire right. uh, stage. And I'm trying to imagine what it would be like, what would happen in the future? What would be enabled by th this revolution? Um, Great question. I think I look at it in two ways. One is, I don't know, right? Before we understood physics and chemistry, could we have even figured out that the car existed? Um, but beyond that, I think you know, more concretely, what's incumbent on us is continuing to make this accessible to more and more people. You know, 20 years ago, you'd have to know how to write SQL to get data out of a database. You would have to have a, you know, some mastery of a tool to be able to draw a chart once you had that data. And so the amount of technology you personally had to understand end-to-end -end to make this happen meant that it was this very small group of people who could actually engage in this. Now we're just kind of at the next stage. And you know, that, that was sort of the one person in a canoe stage. Now we're at the stage where, okay, I can navigate a boat full of people somehow. I've gotten over the problem that all the engine noise makes it hard for me to feel the current and I can take more people. What happens when everyone can get in their own canoe and go, and can get there instantly? So I think it's a it's a broader societal shift. That's you know I'm not a I'm not an anthropologist, um, but I think it's something much bigger than what we can even imagine. Just imagine everyone could have this flexibility, this power to understand their lives, whether it is you know data from some stupid watch or data from the stock exchange or from research, science, anyone could get to that data and actually start seeing and understanding it in a way that we could you know, start approaching what astronomers have been looking at for years about Kepler and just develop that understanding in 10 minutes here. That's what excites me the most.
Okay. So um, I, I liked your comment there about uh, having a conversation with the data. Um, I'm not someone that usually analyzes a data set. And when I see things like the grid pattern that you had up there, I would look at that and think that I'd done something wrong with the tool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any confidence that I was seeing something about the nature of reality. I would think that it was an artifact of how I had set up the data analysis. So how, how do you help people to understand that they're actually seeing something real? Uh, well, and beyond that, even if I do understand the data, how do I know that my interpretation is right? How do I know that I have the right data even, right? Maybe I only had half the Kepler data. You'd never know. I wouldn't know either, right, if I missed it. So I think to, to get to that question, it's not just a matter of naivete, because even the most seasoned user of data, I, you know, someone who's expert at data visualization is subject to not necessarily knowing what we're looking at. So. I think the answer to that is to be able to have multiple perspectives on it quickly and easily, right? The same tool that lets the average person start unlocking their data means that I don't have to trust this one path I use to get from here to there even as an expert. I can start asking validating questions. I can start thinking about what other data I might be able to bring in. How else could I look at this in a way that will either underscore or undermine what I'm looking at? So. That gets into that, you know, it's really artistic in my description of the, the need for flexible data visualization, but it's also a very pragmatic need that if you can't see and understand the data from lots of different perspectives, you can't be confident you understand it. Um, do you know if it, what newer research has been done on Chernoff faces since I looked at it in 1989? Do you know what Chernoff faces are? The, you got oh. me. Talk, uh, do you want to talk to that? Okay. <laughs> so he's asking about turnoff faces, and, the, and uh, there's absolutely part of the human brain that is good at recognizing faces. It's essential for uh, a social creature like humans to be able to recognize faces so that you can tell if, you, if you're seeing your friends and foes. And so turnoff had this idea, well, we'll, co we'll encode data in facial properties and then tap that part of the brain. And so it was a big fad for a while. Uh, and there's not been any work done recently because it was totally discredited as a useful technique for data visualization. So, so the answer is there's been no recent work on it. But there, there are other people who try and do the same sort of thing. Um, I mean, you'll notice that Jeff talked about a lot of very standard ways of encoding data. Those are the proven ways. And it's really stringing them together to answer your question. That's a really valuable thing. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, it's uh, an extension of what he just said. So, um, the, so the, the idea about the turnoff faces was not just individual features, it, you know, a smile, a particular shape of a smile, the width of the mouth, the size of the eyes, etc. What's interesting about it is that humans, when we look at faces, we integrate all that stuff together, which makes it wildly difficult to actually use all those as a representation because you, that was my dissertation, and I found, holy crap, you just can't... <laughs> predict what someone's going to make of it. But in, uh, you could take the same idea and ask, well, instead of just taking individual features and mapping them to visual features individually, what can you do that will somehow get across interactions of the data? And I just imagine it's still really hard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. So my question is before the, the user even sees the data, they have to model their question using the tool. And so have you seen during your time at Tableau um, kind of ways to make it easier for the user to compose their question or their queries, especially if they're complex, without them knowing about the underlying, understanding the underlying data structure? Uh, yes. So <laughs> I'm gonna add, again, I'll take a couple different tacks on that. One is, I think it's actually important to not make the modeling exercise and the question modeling, both the data and the question modeling, a precursor to starting to get information out, right? The question I wanted to answer ultimately was something about, well, where were these stars and where might they be in the sky? But I, it started with just kind of understanding the data. And this was my sincere exploration of the data. Like, the story I told about hearing, the, reading about it in the news, going to find the data, starting to explore it, 
This is a slightly cleaned up, more straight path version that's a lot less boring than watching me at com my computer for five hours. Um, but I had to be able to do that, that naive question answering in order to be able to build that understanding over time. Um, that being said, there's also the power to, to take a, um, my expert understanding of the data or really someone else's expert understanding of the data and share that with someone else. And I didn't really get into that. It was the, the top left corner of the, corner of the circle? The top left area of the circle where it's act and share was up there where there's a part where you do develop some insight where you have taken your analysis to a point where you want to get it out there. And so then how do I take what I've developed and synthesize it and share it in a way that someone else can make progress and build on my work? Um, that's another whole area where I'm excited to see you know, where are we going? You know, we've just started scratching the surface with what can you do with dashboards and sharing them? You know, scratching the surface, and we've been doing it for 10 years, but there's still so much more to really dig in there. Hi, um, thank you. So the question I have is, you've been talking a lot about digging through the data to understand the data, and then you said that perhaps the next step is um, acting on the data, and that's something that you're really excited about, potentially. Um, the thing I'm wondering about is where do you think or how do you think we'll develop for things like once the user understands the data of making a recommendation or an action based on that data. So perhaps with the Kepler data, it's not as um, applicable, but let's say the stock data that you just said, maybe a visualization that um, gives insights to the stock market and then there's some action that you can interact with that maybe you know the user can buy or sell or building that next step of after you've gotten the insight what do you do with it and what do you think or how do you think we will progress in that uh, direction thank you <laughs> I love that question um, yeah, I, I, it's one thing to sit in a tool on a desktop and, and just kind of build some understanding. And that, that is fairly powerful in and of itself. Uh, I think being able to integrate the data into some other part of the world is, is incredibly powerful as well and really is someplace we've only started to explore. Um, you know, from a computer science perspective, can we start putting programmability into the data so you could actually take it and Here's some, some conclusion I got using my visual sense and I want to take an action forward from here. Definitely, I want to let a computer be able to see the same thing I'm seeing. If it's just pixels on the screen, then you've, you've lost something. Um, there's also, once you get into the, some of the more complex analysis too, about how can I start partnering with the computer to let it ask questions and answer questions that I haven't gotten to yet. So things like machine-based learning, how can you build a really powerful human-computer partnership that lets you explore questions in a new, more powerful way. There's actually a really neat um, viz, I forget who put it together, someone may have seen it recently, about machine-based learning, did a great job explaining it and how it builds on how, yeah, I'm getting off topic, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I wonder if you've done any work looking at uh, the use of animation techniques to uh, reveal insights about your data, and by that I mean both animating your data over time or animating the change in how the data is plotted by kind of cycling an independent variable. So have you done any work looking at the use of animation techniques for revealing? Yeah, a little bit. I'll talk about that. And actually, Jock, if you'd like to weigh in here after I, <laughs> uh, he, he chuckled ominously uh, for those who couldn't hear it. So um, definitely, I mean, there there's a, our ability to perceive animation relies on the ability to um, see that data fairly quickly over time to be able to see the change happening. Um, so it also depends on how big the data is and how, how quickly you can interact with it. Um, then you can do things like pre-cache the data to, to be able to make meaningful use of the animation. Um, I think it's, again, some place that I would love to see us explore more. There's a lot of potential there. Um, though it's also harder for us to, often the same information you can get through, an, through animation, you can explore another way. So I would not want to say that, let's say that animation is the next great frontier for where we want to go. Well, 
Yeah, I, I mean, so Jeff's answer is right, which is to say this is an area for more scientific work to, to, to do, even though we, we all collect, all the user experience designers in the room use animation. We, we need to know more about the fundamental properties of it. One of the things concretely for the data visualization thing is it is very valuable, particularly for a temporal variable to animate it over time, but it's ephemeral. And so what we've known for a very long time is that you also want to plot that, take that temporal variable and plot, plot it spatially. And that the two can work really well together against each other. So you might watch the animation, then flip it to a spatial thing and then look at it that way. Uh, and then of course there's all, this, there's all these issues in, in uh, time, t time series analytics where you might bring statistics to bear on it. But one of the things that we know also is when you're doing the interaction, the second part of what you, you said in your question, uh, you can get into these split attention issues, right, which is where you're manipulating this widget over here and you're trying to see the effect over there. So this is one of the earliest techniques in visualization was called brushing. And I don't think nearly enough science has been done. Is it, is it really a split attention problem, in which case this is very difficult? Or can you do the, is there ways to do the manipulation and, and, and have your attention over here at the same time? And I think there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of work, work that could be done to actually work on that. Uh, but we definitely find that that kind of highlight brushing is, is a very powerful technique. In the Viz community, we talk about uh, coordination between views. And so there's a lot to do. And Jeff's about to talk, so he might say something on this topic. I think, uh, actually, I know you weren't talking about that, Jeff. Yeah. I know. But I actually just want to throw one thing on, uh, to pile on what Jock said. <laughs> um, that, you know, as an example of how, how naive we are at this still, um, when I think about, we recently added a, a feature ta to Tableau where as you move from mark to mark on the viz, you actually, the tooltips would, would stay on the screen smoothly. Before it acted like tooltips in a toolbar that would kind of pop from one to the next. But the moment we made the tooltip start following the mouse smoothly, which is a really crude animation, but we noticed that you could actually attend to one of the numbers or one of the features in the data that we were telling you about the marks and notice things about changes among them that you wouldn't have necessarily caught before if we didn't have the animation. And I would love to say that, oh, we knew that we were going there, but it just turned out to be this serendipity because we are just beginning to figure out what this means. So this is a, this is a question. Um, with conventional statistical analysis, you have a, there's a, long been a, known to be a problem of, uh, you can get into the garbage in, garbage out problem of, you know, not knowing what the assumptions are of the analysis you're using and putting in garbage data and getting out an analysis that you think tells you something, but in fact, it's just garbage. So the question I have is, well, and then we can project forward from when user-friendly statistical packages became available in the 80s and 90s, what started happening was more and more garbage was being <laughs> generated because people who were running statistical analysis who had no knowledge of what they were doing and out came garbage, okay? So the question I have is, with DataViz, we're now getting user-friendly DataViz software. So the question is, is, is there gonna be a garbage in, garbage out problem uh, are there assumptions that, that people who are doing data viz need to know in order to, is there some education that people who do data viz need to have in order to do sensible data viz work? Uh, always. Uh, and hopefully not in every situation though. Um, I, you know, similar to when, when desktop publishing first came out and we gave people the power to abuse the world with typefaces um, and the blink tag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, thankfully, that didn't often lead to incorrect assumptions about the data, right? But, you know, any technology incorrectly applied will, will lead to disastrous results, garbage in, garbage out, as you put it. Um, I think that there is, there is and we have a responsibility to help educate about how to use DataViz more effectively. Some of what we've tried to do to, to accommodate that is to build in smart defaults. So that, for example, if you have a standard category and you compare it with the numbers, you'll get bars by default. But if you change that category to be a time-based one, you'll get a line. So it's probably a better way to look at time-based data. But really, we're just making educated guesses still. Um, you know, 
how, again, Josh, can you already have hand up? Wait, wait, wait. I, I can be loud enough unless you no, want to. Okay, fine. So, um, so you know, it, you're definitely correct. There will, there, there will be a phenomenon like the garbage in and garbage out around easy statistics. Absolutely, that will happen. But the thing about data visualization is um, it, there is this fundamental social aspect to this, which is that when you think you've found a finding, if we can make it really easy for you to share that, what you thought was a finding, with other people, that's a self-correcting part of, of this phenomenon. And uh, that was true for the statistics as well, and it's absolutely true for the data viz as well. And so we're as, we're as interested in story, telling stories with your data, with your data visualizations, as we are with that initial discovery part of it. Yep, yep. And now, we've been waiting so patiently. <laughs> well, that was uh, very similar to my question of thinking about, you have a new technology, how do you protect against the dark side? particularly to the extent it becomes linked to action. So it isn't just, you know, oh, I am carrying around this innocuous incorrect belief, but I went and blew my retirement portfolio on something ill-advised that I saw the truth. Um, and I'm wondering if um, you've thought about ways of not educating in the abstract, but scaffolding internally. So, you know, like if I just have means and I don't show anything about variance, I may think, oh, this is bigger than that and it's all noise. Or if I am treating a ordinal variable like a, a interval scale, I'm gonna be concluding erroneous things. So I'm wondering what kinds of tool internal uh, scaffolding, if you will, you have been thinking about or thoughts on that topic. So sort of same question, but are there things internal to the tools? Sh sharing information is, is one um, that you have evolving ideas on. Yeah, you, you're saying using tools for questionable financial ends reminds me of when my dad would try to play the ponies on the Apple II and figure out how to bet at Aqueduct. Um, How'd that work for him? I still have to go get a job, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we had a house too, so you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that figuring out how to communicate about what the user's done, this, is, this, is, this isn't a new problem. It's just we've possibly gotten more, more potential for damage, right? Um, you don't necessarily want to shove every tool to help understand the data proactively in front of the user. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to, to not offer it. So I think we're just figuring this out, um, in, you know, particularly around statistics. Like we're just starting to scrape meaningfully at what are, how we can help novices understand meaningful statistical analysis. Um, when I think about some of the choices we made in Tableau so far, the best, the best practice we've been consistently applying is one of uh, ongoing information architecture about what are we floating to the top to help people answer the, to help people think of asking the next question that might be coming to their minds. Now that's not the same as saying you're doing it wrong, you might want to look over here instead, but it at least is trying to keep the palette of tools open. You may have more perspective on, on more proactive steps we've taken, but. If you make it easy enough for people to keep asking questions, then they can, be, they can actually adopt that slightly skeptical attitude, mm -hmm. which will make them be less likely to, you know, go, go, go um, whatever the example was, sell their portfolio and get into a bad place financially. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Um, is it almost, are you saying that if, if, if it's easy to ask questions, you can explore and probe uh, more freely. If it's expensive to ask questions, you get attached to that question you asked and the answer you got because you spent so much on it or worked so hard yeah, to get it. That's some cost bias. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna interrupt here because I have the privilege of the microphone and I wanna acknowledge, <laughs> thank you everybody for your participation, but I think well, the question we didn't ask at the very beginning when there were so many new people is, how many parent-child, adult-child combinations are there in this room? And I know of two, and I think that may be a record so far. We've often had parents and small children. Okay, back to you. 
Great. Um, thank you. My question is around uh, your your line of um, uh, thinking around making uh, data visualization more accessible to mere mortals, uh, not just very highly trained data scientists. I was wondering whether you've seen research or you've done research yourself around uh, uh, the, the conversation, the data conversation. Are there uh, best practices or data, data uh, conversation strategies uh, so that it's not so much like the wild, wild west where you have you know, 100 different tools and you're trying to do this and that and this and that. Uh, it's not quite like the circle that you drew. <laughs> That's almost like the wild, wild west, but uh, is there uh, ways in which uh, there are successful uh, patterns of interaction? Is my question somewhat clear? Or I think need, so. Need to ask Maybe a you have a more? specific example in mind that might have illuminated or? Um, well, for example, uh, you know, when you had SQL, you would write a query, uh, you would look at the results, and sometimes it would be trial and error. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, here with data visualization, you have, when you have specific tools like being able to color the data, or maybe you can very easily combine pieces of data together into features that make the visualization easier. You know, there's nothing that teaches you that you know, certain strategies uh, will work. Mm -hmm. So my line of questioning is around, you know, when we, how do we actually get to this world where things are more accessible? You know, not perhaps, uh, the, the folks who are asking the questions might be business people, you know, like the stock uh, market example over here, uh, but they may not necessarily be the data scientists. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I think I get the gist of where so, you're going. So, so when they interact with the data, are there successful interaction strategies or workflow strategies that, that you've encountered um, you know, in your research or other research? Uh, yes, and I think that the, the, it gets to lowering the barrier to asking and answering the questions. That, you know, to, to the, the famous Steve Jobs example of the bicycle for the mind, right? If we, could, if we could, if we start looking at technology as our partner, not that we haven't, right? But if in the, in the pursuit of data visualization, we look at data as, or we look at technology as our partner, and not necessarily as the tool that's going to answer all the questions for us, but something that's actually going to help us ask and answer the questions incrementally in a way that's expressive, in a way that encourages experimentation, then you're less likely to, you know, to be able to ask and answer, I forget, someone else over here was asking about, um, you know, I talked about being able to get at the same question from lots of different angles in order to validate what you're looking at. If we think that it's this, this end all and be all, I'm gonna create this thing, like you don't look at a Word document and say, that's it, I'm done, I better not touch it again. It's something you continue to mold and change. Um, and I think the same thing has gotta be true about how we talk about the data, why it becomes a, a everyday pedestrian thing and not this, when it becomes actually something that people can confidently do they can ask and answer their own questions with their own intelligence and their own expertise augmented by what the computer is doing for them. Um, and yes, there is definitely research based on it. Uh, Dr. Chris Stolte, who's one of our co-founders, his paper on a system called Polaris, which was the precursor to Tableau, gets into that. How when you get into that, it was based on research done at Stanford, where they were actually working with the, um, other departments at Stanford to help them see and understand their data. And they realized that they were building these one-off tools every time, these one-off data visualizations to help them understand. So what if they could lower the barrier and help them ask and answer their own questions and so they can make their own connections with the insights? So yes, that's one, one bit of research in, in a constellation of Hi, I really um, loved your graph with a task and develop insight. Would you be able to bring it back up? Because I just have a few kind of tactical questions. Yeah. Um, so I'm on the product team um, at Chegg and I've got, we've got designers here and our researchers here and our like 
our whole team's here. And <laughs> I just wanted to know if you have some tactical advice on how the product teams and we, along with research and UX and design can really leverage something like this when we're building out a new data product from a, how does, how does user experience work with product to understand what are the tasks, how does research play into it, and I really found that this graph was very useful, but I also want to know exactly how, um, or some specifics on um, how your team might have used it as you're developing Tableau. Sure. Um, well, I can talk about the, my experience in the last four years. Um, the, the way the flow, the cycle of visual analysis informs how we look at the software. As we, as we think about adding new features, how are we going to expand in what we've, what we've built so far? We often ask ourselves, is this going to keep, keep people in the flow? So all of those connections, as complex as they are, as rich as they are, as, as potentially confusing as they are sometimes, they're all important. Because depending on who I am and where I am in my analysis, I'm going to be at a different spot. So we can take a good guess what your next question might be, but we really don't know. We don't know when you're going to find bad data, when you're going to see an interesting outlier, when you're going to decide that the better way to look at this is with a different visualization, or when you need to go get data from someone else. Everything's good, but now I want more, or I want to share it. It's very hard for us to, to conclude that ahead of time. Um, if you look at a tool like Excel, I think it's, an, it's another, or it is a great example of a tool that lets you jump in any direction at any moment. So at one end of the, it, if, if I think about it as a spectrum of flexibility, at one end you might have something like a wizard, which is great for intermediating a very specific, complicated conversation I need to have every now and then. I don't know a lot about this. Please ask me just the questions I need to know to get through this. Shopping carts used to be like that in the internet until we started gaining trust in what was going on. To some place where I really want to be open-ended and I want to jump around. So every time we design a feature, you know, we bring, we're hiring like crazy. We bring new designers on board. We have a process where we, we have um, collegial review as well as senior design review of what people are doing. And the senior design review often gets back to that question, how have you preserved the flow? Because people will think of one scenario. They'll think of, oh, just using Tableau on the desktop, or just using Tableau on the server, or maybe just in the cloud, or they'll forget about mobile, or they'll forget about some other scenario of analysis they want to do, all these different questions. So the best, ex the best answer I have is it's just lots of, of collaborative design, lots of reflection on what you've done, and lots of building up, in our case, a lot of tribal knowledge about how to continually ask those questions. And I think one of our challenges to grow we're 2,500 people now. We were 250 when I started four years ago. We're continuing to grow. Um, is how do we take that tribal knowledge and get it into a place where we can actually express it and codify it? And maybe that's you know a book we can write. Um, what advice would you give then? If you're brand new, you're building a Tableau 2.0. W would this help I you? I your answer to this too, Jock, but because <laughs> Jock was there 11 years ago, so he was he was one of the, the single digit employees. Um, the, the answer yeah. that you'll hear from most people who have been through a startup experience is it's the team of people you assemble. So that's that's the the thing I tell people. So there is stuff around data and whatnot, but the the deep thing is the, is that collaborative team that you you asked in your first question. Uh, getting them to collaborate with each other. And, and, and it's not just the development team, it's also the rest of the company. So mm -hmm. sales, marketing, the whole bit. So. Yeah, and when I look at, when I look with my perspective back in the first dozen hires that Tableau made and they're all still there, um, and they're in leadership positions and they're respected and admired by their teams, I don't know that really there's much I would change. Hi. Um, so um, this may open up with some more previous question, and probably actually related to that circle diagram. <laughs> uh, probably that's better. Here. Yeah. So um, I found um, hidden task uh, in that, that kind of data analytics flow um, between get data and choose visual mapping. So I see like oftentimes user wants to audit data, uh, meaning. Uh, they would like to know if the data itself is accurate and trustful enough. Mm -hmm. So they usually try to like uh, explore the data so that they are confident enough to use this data, right? And then 
I find it particularly uh, hard for these users who is not necessarily data scientist or anal uh, analyst to do the, these data audit tasks because uh, there is uh, some um, possible options. We can probably show them uh, de uh, raw data so that they can explore uh, right. if they are good enough to understand the data structure or probably we can uh, give them uh, some sort of transparency to data in some aggregated uh, tabular manner or stuff like that, but um, I never find any feasible, uh, convincing way to make these users do data audit. So uh, if you could uh, share any insight for that kind of task. Um, well, I don't think it, so um, I wouldn't see doing a data audit as significantly different than doing visual analysis. Um, you may be asking different questions. You may be trying to understand different aspects of what you're digging into. You might use a different level of detail when you're trying to break it down. Um, but as people, if I'm dealing with a million rows of data and 30 columns that are a mix of categories and dates and numbers and whatever else, I can't understand that by looking, I mean, even if I look at the raw data, I can't pull 300 million rows or 300 million cells into my head and make sense of it. So the same tools that you use to do visual analysis, I think, are the same tools that, that let you audit the data. Um, you have to be able to drill into a level of detail. You have to be able to make sense of it. Like, seeing the raw data table is something you can do in Tableau, and it's a really powerful way to be able to understand what is there. What are these columns? So this one, what is disposition? oh, okay, this helps me understand whether this is a confirmed or false positive or whatever. So all these, all the tools of, of visual analysis also help do what you're calling data auditing. So I think we'll take another five minutes of questions and we'll wrap up. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to know if you could talk more about the relationship between data visualization and human memory and what insights that you have found or others have found about um, what particular aspects of, you know, size and space and color help people actually remember things better? Not just the interpretation of it, but to actually over the long time. I don't know specific research, Doc. So that's, so yeah. that's an area of current controversy. So uh, on one side of it, we have people like Edward Tufte who really wants to pare down a data visualization to just exactly you know the fewest n n amount of graphics that actually shows the data and then on the other side we have uh, people exploring um, using imagery or other things like that that uh, taps into human memory but it's much more complicated so the, the classic person in that side was Nigel Holmes and, and there's bo books of his uh, out, out there as well he was very famous for um, the you know some of the f famous graphics and uh, in magazines and whatnot that you, that you would see. The, the war is raging as we sit here in this room. Um, but there, there, people, I, mean, I think that people who design things know how to create things that are memorable. Um, but then the toughties of the world will say, but then you, you're, you're misleading, can be misleading people. And so there's this, there's this when you get into the area of telling stories with data, narrative becomes much more important. And that's where the battle's really raging today. But but it, but it is it is a battle. It's it's not it's not settled in any, any sense of the word. So, so I'm going to pile on there again yeah, too. You should. He, he, he's a storyteller. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to, you know I, it was funny because I heard a chuckle go through the room like when I turned to Jock and asked him to answer the question. But to to get to your question about how do you how do you make sure you, you don't make mistakes early on in your company. Um, or what would I, I think you asked, what would we go back and change about Tableau? I think that that ability to sincerely identify the edge of your knowledge and acknowledge it in front of a room of people and turn it over to someone else is a huge part. I mean, I'm now making me sound great, but it's Tableau's culture that has enabled that ability. So that's also, and I'm not just saying that to sell Tableau, but we are hiring. Um, <laughs> we do have an event tomorrow night. Um, but putting that aside, it's, I was talking to um, a VP of Rolls-Royce Asia. So Rolls-Royce Asia, they don't make cars. They do 
boats, they do ship engines, they do nuclear reactors that go in subs, things like that. And they had a new vice president come in and say, we are going to start communicating through data visualization when we want to start communicating at the highest level. And this now meant that the managers in Europe, or the managers in China, could see what the managers in Australia were doing with their business and vice versa. And that ability to be transparent, that ability to be able to you know, do things like effectively audit, as Jock was saying, once everyone can see your data, it's not just always your intended audience, but everyone who can see it, you know, your, your culture can go one of two ways. It can either fall apart because you know, everything deserves to fall apart because it's so bad, or it can be, wait, you can see my dirty laundry and I can see yours. And so that culture of transparency, that culture of sharing data is a big part of also why this is such powerful technology because it does just surface the truth. We got one more down front. Hi, hi Jeff, thanks for the presentation. I think this is the second time uh, I hear a presentation. Um, um, my question is about growing amount of data. Like you said, 30 million rows of data. How do you deal with it? And it's not just rows. Also, the column can grow. Like mm -hmm. we used to collect 10 columns of data, now 100 or even more. And even the cadence of, the, of collecting data is growing. So uh, I wonder, uh, have you seen users struggle with this um, growing amount of data? Um, d do they spend more time on picking like which column they should use to answer the questions? Like, do, do they spend more time like doing aggregation or removing like noise from the data? Um, like, what's your solution? Or do you think the current drag and drop data visualization tool is the solution to this kind of question? Oh gosh, if we had the answer already, then that'd be kind of boring. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it is a powerful. It is one powerful metaphor. I, you know, especially when you get to the the question of data with huge dimensionality or you know, hundreds of measures. I mean, imagine what the web logs look like for Google. Um, I think that you've really tapped into a place that we, I haven't seen any great answers yet. Um, there are some things, you know, we, yes, aggregation is a great way to deal with lots of rows, right? There are ways to deal with that, and there's also sampling and statistical analysis and so forth. But in the case where you have lots and lots of columns, especially lots and lots of dimensions, and where do you find the relationships among them? We're doing some research in this area at Tableau to try to figure out how do you figure out where are the interesting relationships, what are the things I want to look at together. Um, because when you have 100 dimensional data, which two dimensions or five or 10 dimensions actually inform what you need to do? It's machine learning also. Um, you've touched on, I think, a cutting edge of where we need to keep going forward, and also why we're not done, right? We're at just the beginning of this because, yeah, there's more data and the data is going to get richer and we're going to find more of it and start creating it even faster. I don't have the statistics, but something in the shape of Moore's Law that goes up really fast is applying to the amount of data and the shape of it over time as well. Um, and so we've got to keep innovating. Well, thanks everyone. I appreciate your attention and questions. <laughs> a lot of fun.